going to start with the beginning of chapter 5, He Restoreth My Soul. In studying this psalm, it must always be remembered that it is a sheep in the Good Shepherd's care who is speaking. It is essentially a Christian's claim of belonging to the family of God. As such, he boasts of the benefits of such a relationship. This being the case, one might well ask, Why then is this statement, He restoreth my soul? Surely it would be assumed that anyone in the Good Shepherd's care would never become so distressed in soul as to need restoration. But the fact remains that this does happen. Even David, the author of the psalm, who was much loved of God, knew what it was to be cast down and dejected. He had de tasted defeat in his life and felt the frustration of having fallen under temptation. David was well acquainted with the bitterness of feeling hopeless and without strength in himself. In Psalms 42 and 11 he cries out, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Now there is an exact parallel to this in caring for sheep. Only those intimately acquainted with sheep and their habits understand the significance of a cast sheep or a cast down sheep. This is an old English shepherd's term for a sheep that has turned over on its back and cannot get up again by itself. A cast sheep is a very pathetic sight. Lying on its back, its feet in the air, it flays away, frantically struggling to stand up without success. Sometimes it will bleat a little for help, but generally it lies there lashing about in frightened frustration. If the owner does not arrive on the scene within a reasonably short time, the sheep will die. This is but another reason why it is so essential for a careful sheepman to look over his flock every day, counting them to see that all are able to be up and on their feet. If one or two is missing, often the first thought to flash in his mind is, Oh, my sheep must be cast somewhere. I must go in search and set it on its feet again. One particular ewe I had owned in a flock of sheep was notorious for being a cast sheep. Every spring when she became heavy in lamb, it was not uncommon for her to become cast every second or third day. Only my diligence made it possible for her to survive from one season to the next. One year, I had to be away from the ranch for a few days just when she was having her problems. So I called my young son aside and told him he would be responsible for her well-being while I was absent. If he managed to keep her on her feet until I came home, he would be well paid for his efforts. Every evening after school, he went out to the fields faithfully and set up the old ewes so she would survive. It was quite a task, but she rewarded us with a fine pair of twin lambs that spring. It is not only the shepherd who keeps a sharp eye for cast sheep, but also predators, buzzards, vultures, dogs, coyotes, and cougars all know that a cast sheep is easy prey and death is not far off. This knowledge that any cast sheep is helpless, close to death, and vulnerable to attack makes the whole problem of cast sheep serious for the manager. Nothing seems to arouse his constant care and diligent attention at, to the flock as the f fact that the largest, fattest, and strongest, sometimes the healthiest sheep, can become cast and be a casualty. Actually, it is often the fat sh sheep that are the most easily cast. The way it happens is this, a heavy, fat, or long fleece sheep will lie down comfortably in some hollow or depression on the ground. It may roll on its side slightly to stretch out or relax. Suddenly the center of gravity in the body shifts so it turns on its back far enough that the feet no longer touch the ground. 
It may feel a sense of panic and start to paw frantically. Frequently, this only makes things worse. It rolls over even further. Now it is quite impossible for it to regain its feet. As it lies there struggling, gases begin to build up in the rumen, and these expand and they tend to retard and cut off the blood circulation to the extremities of the body, especially the legs. If the weather is very hot and sunny, a cast sheep can die in a few hours. If it is cool and cloudy and rainy, it may survive in this position for several days. If the cast sheep is a ewe with lambs, of course, it is a multiple loss to the owner. If the lambs are unborn, they too will perish with her. If they are young and sucklings, they become orphans, all of which adds to the seriousness of the situation. So it will be seen why a sheepman's attention is always alert for this problem. During my own years as a keeper of sheep, perhaps some of the most poignant memories are wrapped around the commingled anxiety of keeping account of my flock and repeatedly saving and restoring cast sheep. It is not easy to convey on paper the sense of this ever-present danger. Often I would go out early and merely cast my eye across the sky. If I saw the black-winged buzzards circling overhead in their long, slow spirals, anxiety would grip me. Leaving everything else, I would immediately go out into the rough wild pastures and count the flock to make sure everyone was well, fit, and able to be on its feet. This is part of the pageantry and drama depicted for us in the magnificent story of the ninety and nine sheep and one astray. There is the shepherd's deep concern, his agonizing search, his longing to find that missing one, his delight in restoring it not only to its feet but also to the flock as well as to himself. Again and again I would spend hours searching for a single sheep that was missing. Then, more often than not, I would see it at a distance down on its back, lying helpless. At once I would start to run towards it, hurrying as fast as I could, for every minute was critical. Within me was a mingled sense of fear and joy within me joy that it was found at all as soon as i reached the cast ewe my first impulse would be to pick it up tenderly i would roll the sheep over on its side this would relieve the pressure of the gases in the room in if she had been down for long i would have to lift her on her feet and then straddling the sheep with my legs i would hold her erect rubbing her limbs to restore the circulation to her legs this often took quite a little time. When the sheep started to walk again, she often just stumbled, staggered, collapsed in a heap once more. All the time I would work on the calf sheep, I would talk gently. When are you going to learn to stand on your own feet? I'm so glad I found you in time, you rascal. And so the conversation would go, always couched in language that combined tenderness and rebuke, compassion and correction. Little by little the sheep would regain its equilibrium, and it would start to walk steadily and surely. By and by it would dash away to join the others, set free from its fears and frustrations, given another chance to live a little longer. All this pageantry is conveyed to my heart and mind when I repeat the simple statement, He restoreth my soul. There is something intensely personal, intensely tender, intensely enduring, yet intensely fraught with danger in the picture. On the one hand, the sheep is so helpless, so utterly immobilized, though otherwise strong, healthy, and flourishing, while on the other hand, it is the attentive owner, quick and ready to come to the rescue, ever patient and tender and helpful. At this point, it is important to point out that the similarity in the Christian life, there is an exciting and comforting parallel here. Many people have the idea that when a child of God falls, when he is frustrated and helpless in a spiritual dilemma, that God becomes disgusted, fed up, and even furious with him. This is simply not so. 
One of the greatest revelations of the heart of God given to us by Christ is that He, as our shep- He is our shepherd. He has the same identical sensations of anxiety, concern, and compassion for cast men and women as I had for cast sheep. This is precisely why he looked upon people with such pathos and compassion. It explains his mag- magnanimous dealing with down-and-out individuals for whom even society had no use. It reveals why he wept over those who spurred his affection. It discloses the depth of his understanding of undone people to whom he came eagerly and quickly and ready to help, ready to save, to restore. When I read the life story of Jesus Christ and examine carefully his conduct and coping with human need, I see him again and again as the good shepherd picking up cast sheep. The tenderness, the love, the patience that he used to restore Peter's soul after that terrible tragedy of his temptation is a classic picture of the Christ coming to restore one of his own. And so he comes quietly, gently, reassuring to me no matter when or where or how I may be cast down. In Psalms 56 and 13, we are given an accurate commentary on this aspect of the Christian's life. In these words, Thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God? and the light of the living. We have to be realistic about the life of a child of God and face the facts as they really are. Most of us, though we belong to Christ and desire to be under His control and endeavor to allow ourselves to be led by Him, do on occasion find ourselves cast down. We discover that often when we are most sure of ourselves, we can stumble and fall. Sometimes, when we appear to be flourishing in our faith, we find ourselves in a situation of utter frustration and futility. Paul, in writing to the Christians at Corinth, warned them of this danger. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Admittedly, this may appear to be one of the paradoxes and enigmas of our spiritual lives. When we examine it carefully, however, we will not find it too difficult to understand. As with sheep, so with Christians. Some basic principles and parallels apply that will help us to get a grasp the way in which a man or a woman can be cast. There is, first of all, the idea of looking for a soft spot. The sheep that choose the comfortable, soft, rounded hollows in the ground in which to lie down very often become cast. In such a situation, it's easy to roll over on their backs. In the Christian life, there is great danger in always looking for the easy place, the cozy corner, the comfortable position where there's no hardship, no need for endurance, no demand for self-discipline. The time that we think we have it made, so to speak, is actually when we are in mortal danger. There is such a thing as the discipline of poverty and privation, which can be self-imposed to do us worlds of good. Jesus suggested to the rich young man, who mistakenly assumed he was in a safe position, when in truth he was on the verge of being cast down. Sometimes, if through self-indulgence I am unwilling to forego or forfeit the soft life, the easy way, the cozy corner, then the Good Shepherd may well move me to a pasture where things aren't quite so comfortable, not only for my own good, but also for His benefit as well. There is the aspect, too, of a sheep simply having too much wool. Often, when the fleece becomes very long, heavily matted and with mud, manure, and burrs and other debris, it's easier for a sheep to become cast, literally weighed down with its own wool. Wool in the scriptures depicts the old self-life in the Christian. It is the outward expression 
of an inner attitude, the assertion of my own desire and hopes and aspirations. It is the area of my life in which and through which I am continually in contact with the world around me. Here is where I find the clinging accumulation of things, possessions, of worldly ideas beginning to weigh me down, drag me down, and hold me down. It is significant that no high priest was ever allowed to wear wool when he entered in to the Holy of Holies. This spoke of pride, self, personal preference, and God could not tolerate it. If I wish to go on walking with God and not be forever cast down, this is an aspect of my life which he must deal with drastically. Whenever I found that a sheep was being cast because it had too long and too heavy a fleece, I soon took swift steps to remedy the situation. In short order, I would shear it clean, so to forestall the danger of having the ewe lose her life. This is not always a pleasant process. Sheep do not enjoy being sheared, and it represents some hard work for the shepherd, but it must be done. Actually, when it is all over, both sheep and owner are relieved. There is no longer the threat of being cast down, while for the sheep there is the pleasure of being set free from a hot, heavy coat. Often the fleece is clogged with filthy manure, mud, burrs, sticks, and ticks. What a relief to be rid of it all. And similarly, in dealing with our old self-life, there will come a day when the master must take us in hand and simply the keen cutting edge of his word to our lives as he applies it. It may be an unpleasant business for a time. No doubt we'll struggle and kick about it. We may get a few cuts and wounds, but what a relief when it is all over. Oh, the pleasure of being set free from ourselves. What a restoration. The third chief cause of a cast sheep is simply that they are too fat. It is a well-known fact that over-fat sheep are neither the most healthy nor the most productive, and certainly it is the fattest that most often are cast. Their weight simply make it much harder for them to be agile and nimble on their feet. Of course, once a sheepman even suspects that his sheep are becoming cast for this reason, he will take long-range steps to correct the problem. He will put the ewes on a more rigorous ration, and they will get less grain, and the general condition of the flock will be watched very closely. It is his aim to see that the sheep are strong, sturdy, energetic, not fat, flabby, and weak. Turning to the Christian life, we are confronted with the same sort of problem. There is the man or woman who, because they may have done well in business or their careers or their homes, feel that they have, are flourishing and have arrived. They may have a sense of well-being and self-assurance, which in itself is dangerous. Often when we are most sure of ourselves, we are most prone to fall flat. In his warnings to the Church of Revelation 3 and 17, God points out that Though some considered themselves rich and affluent, they were actually in desperate danger. The same point is made by Jesus in his account of the wealthy farmer who intended to build more and bigger barns, but who in fact faced utter ruin. Material success is no measure of spiritual health, nor is it apparent affluence any criteria for real godliness. And it is well for us that the shepherd of our souls sees through our exterior and takes set steps to set things right. He may impose on us some sort of diet or discipline, which we might find a bit rough and unpalatable at first. But again we need to reassure ourselves that it is for our own good, because he is fond of us, and for his own reputation as the good shepherd. In Hebrews 12, we read how God ch chooses to discipline those that he loves. At the time, it might prove a tough routine, but the deeper truth is that afterwards, it produces a life of repose and tranquility, free from fret and frustration of being cast down like a helpless sheep. 
the toughness it takes to face life and the formidable reverses which it brings to us can come only through the discipline of endurance and hardship. In His mercy and love, our Master makes this a part of our program. It is part of the price of belonging to Him. We may rest assured that He will never expect us or ask us to face more than we can stand. And this is reference to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. But what He does expose us to will strengthen and fortify our faith and confidence in His control. If He is the Good Shepherd, we can rest assured that He knows what He is doing. This in and of itself should be sufficient to continually refresh and restore my soul. I know of nothing which so quiets and enlivens my own spiritual life as the knowledge that God knows what He is doing with me. God knows what He is doing with me. Amen.